Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to boost your health or go plant-based, then do we have the Vegan Starter Kit show for you. Today I'll be talking with Dr. Neil Bernard, New York Times best-selling author, one of the leading authorities on plant-based diets, and the author of a fun guide to shifting your diet, the Vegan Starter Kit. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about what you need to know and about getting started with plant-based eating. That, plus we'll talk about Bill Clinton, Ellen DeGeneres, Venus Williams, Carl Lewis, Fiona Oaks, the power of hummus, Patrick Babaumian, and what in the world carrot cake muffins have to do with anything. So welcome to the show, Neil. Are you ready to shine? You bet. Thank you so much for including me. Thank you so much for being here in a mighty woohoo. So before we dive right into things, where did you grow up and what did your family do? Uh, Fargo, North Dakota. Um, my family was in the cattle business for as long as I can count, um, except my dad did not like the cattle business. He left. He went off to medical school, came back to the Midwest, um, and became the diabetes expert for Fargo, North Dakota. Did he inspire you then to follow his footsteps into medicine? Quite the reverse. Um, I never once heard him say that anybody ever got better. Um, diabetes was kind of a losing game. Um, at that point. So no, that, that actually wasn't it at all. And if I could rewind a little bit, I would love to show him some of what we have found yeah. on how you can tackle diabetes, not so much with sharp needles, but with um, but with food. Very, very cool. We'll get out into that in a little bit. And as somebody who struggled with blood sugar to about somewhere between, oh, now I guess about seven years ago. Wow, I'm doing great. Um, a diet made a revolutionary difference in my life. So how did you get interested in medicine? Um, I was in a little college in St. Paul, Minnesota called McAllister College. And um, I was very interested in psychology and just how the mind worked. And I decided kind of near the end of college that rather than go to grad school in psychology, I wanted to go to medical school to do psychiatry because I thought there's a, um, a huge medical aspect to all this. And that was the, that was all I was interested in. I wasn't interested in internal medicine or diabetes or asthma or pediatrics or anything. I was just interested in the mind. Um, and it was only a number of years later after I finished my residency um, that I started getting into the, the food side of medical practice. It's interesting. I, I dated a girl for a, for a long time who was uh, ironically in uh, PRC, PRCA, Professional Rodeo Cowboy Association. She was going to CSU vet school in Colorado, in Fort Collins, Colorado. And what she was finding is you could tell what an animal's diet was when you did their autopsy. It told all. What did you start learning when you began doing autopsies? Yeah, actually, the year before I went to medical school, I had a job um, helping out at autopsies in a hospital in Minneapolis. Um, the pathologist would come in, and I, I would like hold things and weigh them and clean everything up at the, at the end. And one day, we had a guy who died in the hospital of a massive heart attack. And so he removed a big section of ribs off the chest, and he yeah. showed me the heart, and it was filled with this atherosclerotic plaque and so forth. Um, at the end of the exam, he uh, left the room. You know, he'd written up, you know, massive atherosclerosis, myocardial infarction, blah, blah, blah. He was gone. Um, I had to clean the body up. So I put the ribs back in the chest, and I sewed the skin up. And then I went up to the cafeteria when I was done, and they were serving ribs for lunch. And I have to tell you that it um, looked like a dead body and it smelled like a dead body. And I realized that's exactly what it is. And so I didn't become a vegetarian on the spot, but I couldn't eat that. And as time went on, this kind of percolated in my mind. And so eventually I did stop eating meat and then all animal products. It's, it's interesting. I'd, I've been a vegan or vegetarian uh, almost my whole life, but um, was was sometimes a fish eater or something as a kid. You, you really had to struggle to try to get me to eat anything in the, the meat family. And I can remember coming back from like biology 101 or something like that, home on a college break. And, and there was lobster in front of me. And all I kept thinking of is, is this is doing a biology experiment on a living being. And I actually right. come from a family of either attorneys or fishermen, and sometimes both. <laughs> and then I was like, I can't do this. I absolutely couldn't do it. So before we get into, um, before we get into all things uh, 
plant-based. What can you tell us about Bill Clinton or Ellen DeGeneres? Well, both of them, um, somewhere along the line, got very interested in shifting their diets. And I guess with Bill Clinton, it's, it's well known because he was a fairly young man when he started having heart problems and he had heart surgery and uh, his problems continued. And he was famous for jogging to McDonald's and, you know, eating unhealthy food. Um, and the lesson came home to him that uh, surgery or a second time was particularly risky, but that if he made a diet change, maybe he wouldn't need the surgery at all. So he, um, he had been friends with Dean Ornish for quite some time. And Dean Ornish, of course, had done this tremendous pioneering work on lifestyle changes, especially plant-based diets, uh, for heart patients. And I'm sure that you can actually open up the arteries again with just diet and lifestyle changes alone. And Caldwell Esselstyn was, I think, very influential for the, the president as well. Um, and uh, he changed his diet and lost well, something like 26 pounds, if I'm remembering correctly, looked better than he looked in years, uh, never needed the surgery, uh, did really well. And Ellen DeGeneres, um, kind of same story, uh, except minus the heart disease. She just, she partly has a heart for animals and, and uh, for health reasons and everything else, um, made similar diet changes. Now, um, I don't know that either one of them is, is entirely perfectly plant-based every day, but on the other hand, they've gone very much in that direction and, and have inspired other people too. And, and, and you've got me thinking, I just was scanning through things. I'm going cross country skiing with my wife just after this. And I have to take a mouse in what we have is it's called now a mouse hotel. And I have to repatriate it down the hill because we use, uh, we, we are neurotic about no kill and saving all the mice in this house when they come uh, tromping along looking for food. Maybe you can tell us briefly about Venus Williams. Uh, Venus Williams was, you know, obviously a tremendous tennis player, um, but she started to get lots of pain and many symptoms. She ended up being diagnosed with something called Sjogren's disease. Um, Sjogren's is a condition of tremendous dryness of the mouth and of the eyes, and it has uh, syst uh, systemic effects as well. And her game just tanked. Um, what do you do? Turns out it's an autoimmune condition, as are many other things. Rheumatoid arthritis is autoimmune. Asthma is autoimmune. Thyroid diseases are typically autoimmune. So an autoimmune condition means that your body is making antibodies to some kind of protein that you're inhaling or ingesting or something. Um, so uh, a smart person along the way advised her to try a completely plant-based diet. And she got her game back um, and did really well. She influenced her sister. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not, you know, she's, the, the Williams sisters are just, you know, the top of the women's tennis world. And the top of the men's tennis world, Novak Djokovic, who won Wimbledon, won the U.S. Open. I mean, just phenomenal player. Uh, same story. Um, has a vegan restaurant. Um, so uh, it's really cool to see that, that athletes, much as we try to, to to encourage people from a medical standpoint, do this for your health, a lot of people are saying, I, you know, I just want that extra edge, um, whether it comes from quicker recovery after athletics or better tissue oxygenation so that I can outlast the competition. We, we're seeing it, uh, long distance runners, tennis players, now football, American football. Uh, you know, they want to be big, but they want to be muscular, not flabby. So it's really cool to see. Uh, a lot of people going vegan for for uh, those reasons too. Excellent, and and I was a uh, a professional bicycle racer. I raced in Europe for several years, and I'm convinced that going vegan helped me as well, particularly with recovery. But also one that's interesting is strength without bulk, meaning there's a certain yeah. amount of size that I'm convinced had an inflammatory factor to it, and you're carrying around all this sluggish extra weight. And so it's not that you become a swizzle stick or lose your strength. I believe you actually get stronger, but, but it's more like my blood pressure when I was at my biggest was way up and, and getting on a healthier diet that came way, way down. That actually begets the question. Let's talk about some of the health benefits. One of the ones that's, that's unusual. I want to ask about, because you just mentioned, what can you tell us about thyroid? Okay. Um, by the way, before we get to thyroid, let me just come back to your bicycle. Yes. Um, real quick. 
um, you know, your muscles are working and working and working and working. Your average person gets on a bike or they get on a treadmill or they go running and they poop out kind of quickly. And if you could look into their arteries, you know, let's say you have a cheese sandwich with extra mayo and maybe some chicken or some beef uh, during the day. The fat that's in dairy products and meat is very high in saturated fat. That's the solid fat. As that gets into your bloodstream, it makes the blood more viscous, more thick. And so it's more like grease, less like water. So it doesn't flow as well. And if blood flow is sluggish to your muscles, that means you're not getting the oxygen delivery. That means your muscles start feeling fatigued sooner. It means your recovery is going to be slower too. You get all that out and the viscosity of the blood goes way down. Yep. The oxygenation improves. And so your endurance is going to be that much better. Now, if you're a really well-trained athlete, you know, you've got hopefully pretty big arteries and good circulation, but on the margin, what you had for breakfast or for lunch or for dinner is going to give you that advantage or not, depending on, on what you ate. Thank you. So, anyway, I, I, back to, well, I want to go, I want to go, go there for one more second because you just reminded me of the crazy coach that I had at 14 years of age, and he was completely insane off his rocker, but one of the things that he told me that stuck was that dairy creates inflammation and will actually congest your lungs. And I'll be darned, because I struggled with exercise-induced asthma for many years, I'll be darned, when you cut out the dairy, you breathe much better. Did your asthma improve when you, when you changed Absolutely. your diet? Absolutely. You know, I, I, this is so important. There, there are people probably listening to this program now where their, their, their child or their nephew or their niece has asthma. And to that person, I would say, run, do not walk to a completely plant-based diet. Chuck out the dairy completely. No cow's milk, no goat's milk, no animal milk. Because the, for whatever reason, those products for some kids trigger that autoimmune reaction. The body says, what is this foreign protein? Um, it, it, the body reacts as if it's a virus or a bacterium that has entered and it makes antibodies. Those antibodies end up attacking your own tissues. They, they also create, the inflammatory process also creates various molecules that circulate in the blood and aggravate the inflammation. And suddenly you get this vice in your chest going um, And at worst, it's scary. I, I mean, at, at best it's scary, at worst it can be fatal. Um, asthma can be a killer. And um, so many kids, they just, you can't exercise, you can't go to a friend's house if they got a dog, you know, during certain times of year, the seasonal allergies are killing you. And when you get away from the dairy, it's not necessarily that you are allergic to dairy. It's that dairy makes the other reactions worse. I've heard this. And so you discover, I just don't react to things anymore. I don't need my inhaler anymore. So, um, and I'm not asking people to take this on faith. You just try it. Um, and give it a couple of months. It, it, for some people, it's like day and night. For others, it takes a little while. But you make that change, and it can be a miraculous change for people. Last note on this, then we'll get back to that original question, which is I found yeah. there's a lot of hidden sources of dairy. For instance, I loved my pizza. And so I would go with dairy-free pizza, but guess what? It turns out that dairy-free cheese and a lot of the dairy-free cheese that you buy, I'll put that in quotes, in the marketplace has cassian in it which is basically dairy. It's the protein yeah. from the milk that's spun out and then put right back into your non-cheese cheese. That's right. You know, the, the, um, to help people go vegan, uh, there are lots of folks making vegan cheeses, and they really are vegan. There's no animal products in most of them. Um, some of them, some things called non-dairy creamers actually have dairy protein in them. Um, but even the ones that truly are vegan are often quite fatty. So I really think of those as sort of uh, dairy methadone. You know, they're Thank there to you. help yes. you over your addiction. You use them during the transition, but over the long run, you're gonna you're gonna want to stay with kind of simpler foods than that. I, that's what I consider a lot of the uh, the frozen patties as well. We'll call it meat methadone because once they once they throw in canola oil and this and that. Um, yes, you're not getting the animal fats, but that's a whole nother topic we will get to. All right. First off, go to thyroid and other conditions that can be helped by going predominantly plant-based. Yeah. You know, thyroid disease is, has really been a, a kind of a mystery and, and, and it still is. I think we're kind of on the frontiers here, but, uh, what we know mm -hmm. is that thyroid 
your, your thyroid gland, you hear at the base of your neck, it, it makes thyroid hormone and thyroid hormone is responsible for metabolism and lots of things. And if it is not behaving, you can be sluggish, you can have many, many, a whole long list of symptoms. So a person goes to the doctor, they get diagnosed with low thyroid. The most common cause of low thyroid in the US is not iodine deficiency, although that, that occurs sometimes in other countries, not so much here because we have iodized salt and so forth. But the most common reason here, it's autoimmune. Now the opposite can happen uh, where your thyroid is too high. Your thyroid gland is cranking out the thyroid hormone. Um, that can be an autoimmune process as well. In both cases, an immune reaction is either attacking, is, is attacking the thyroid, either causing it to, to shut down or pushing the gas pedal down a little bit too much. Um, we are, frankly, I think we are still exploring and understanding this, but there have been a number of people who have done what I described for asthma, but as a treatment for thyroid disease. And they discover that their thyroid numbers come right back to toward the middle of where they want them to be. Now, I encourage anybody with any medical illness, see your doc. If you've got thyroid disease, see your endocrinologist and so forth. But there is ne never a reason not to do a completely healthy plant-based diet and see if it doesn't uh, spare you from needing uh, thyroid medication and thank you, needing thank further you. work. So let's, let's go from there. Let's talk briefly about uh, diabetes. Yeah, diabetes means there's too much sugar in the blood. Yeah. And so a lot of people imagine, well, that means I've been drinking too many sodas with sugar. Not really the reason. They should, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying sugar is health food. I mean, even if it's called Dr. Pepper, it's not, you know, soda is not healthy. However, that's not the cause of diabetes. If you have a high blood sugar in response to soda, that's just a sign that there's something wrong. And what is wrong is this. Normally, sugar in the blood, glucose in the blood, goes into your muscle cells and it provides power for them. That, that's normal, that's good. Glucose is like gasoline for your car. And glucose also goes, goes to your brain, it goes to your liver, it goes to all the tissues in the body and it's their main source of fuel. Um, in type two diabetes, and frankly type one, uh, something is misbehaving so the glucose can't get into the cell where it belongs and instead it's building up outside. And then if you drink a soda, you know, that builds up even more and more and more. But, but it turns out that the reason the sugar can't get in the cell is because the cell has built up fat particles. Uh, I ate a chicken salad sandwich for lunch. It was filled with, with grease and it had extra mayo on it and a slice of cheese. And the fat in those foods got into my blood and it entered the muscle cells and it stops insulin which is the hormone that attaches to the cell and is like a key to let the glucose inside. That fat buildup in the cell stops that insulin key from being able to work. So our research team, back in 2003, the National Institute, Institutes of Health funded us to test vegan diets, not just for weight loss or lowering cholesterol, the things you'd expect, but for type 2 diabetes. And what we found is that it's better, basically, than any other diet. Um, it, you get the animal fat out, you keep the vegetable oils low too, and suddenly your insulin starts working again. And it's a really uh, cool thing to see people whose diabetes just improves and improves or sometimes even goes away. Beautiful, beautiful. Would you say that all fat is created equal or is there something different about animal fat? Oh, great question. Um, I would say that animal fat, animal fat is very high in what's called saturated fat. That's the fat that's solid at room temperature, like bacon grease or like butter. Um, I think it's the worst actor. However, if a person is trying to lose weight or they're trying to tackle diabetes, we really keep all fats low. So a vegan diet would have no animal fat at all. But I would also encourage people to learn non-oil cooking techniques so they're not adding grease to things. You know, there, there will be traces of fat. Uh, you know, if you have even a sprig of broccoli straight off the plant, there are tiny traces of natural oils, you know, maybe seven or eight percent of the calories. But um, if you take if, if you take a thousand olives and you throw away all the pulp and all the fiber and you concentrate that oil and you pour it all over your pasta, that's something that nature never thought you were going to do. And you're suddenly concentrating the fat and concentrating the calories and it makes weight loss harder. So um, we do avoid all animal products, but we keep oils really low, too. 
So, so it begets. There, there are two big popular diets here, and, and I don't believe one size fits all in life, but there are two popular diets. One is which is just starting to crank up to the moon. You can just see it starting to go through the roof that may actually have some challenges, keto and Mediterranean. Yeah, well, a Mediterranean diet, a Mediterranean diet is named after the Mediterranean, which is actually a vast region. It's all of North Africa, um, the Western part of the, the Middle East, um, all of Southern Europe. Uh, but the, as the, the way the term has been used is really thinking sort of Southern Italy, maybe Spain, maybe a little bit of Greece, part of France. Um, and frankly, it is better than what people are eating now. You know, I mean, instead of chicken wings, I mean, they're having more pasta, more uh, chickpeas and beans and so forth. And they're, they're pretty much down on dairy, not much dairy, um, not much meat, but it's sort of halfway toward vegan. Um, and when you look at people who follow a Mediterranean diet, their weight loss is not really as good as it would be on a vegan diet. And their, their clinical results aren't, aren't quite the same, but, you know, but, but it's better than what they were doing before. Um, now, a keto diet, I have to say, I think is a mistake. Um, the ketogenic diet says if you starve your cells for carbohydrate, which is their favorite fuel, then you're going to have to lose weight. And carbohydrates from grains and beans and starchy vegetables and fruits, all this stuff, that's about half of what people eat. And if you take all of that away, you're going to lose weight. Um, but what you're left with, um, meat, fatty cheeses and things like that, uh, for some people, that makes their cholesterol really go up badly. And when we look at just mortality, do you live or do you die? Uh, the mortality over the long run is much higher in people on these high protein, low carbohydrate diets. So um, it's a recurrent fad that just won't go away, but I wouldn't recommend it for anyone. Well, I, I, one, one exception. Um, there, is, there, there are some cases where kids have intractable seizures. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about epilepsy. That just uh, This is quite rare, but it does happen. And these kids, for some reason, when you, po it sounds creepy, but you poison the brain with ketone bodies by depriving the body of carbohydrate, uh, their seizures do improve. Um, if you are not in that category, I would suggest avoiding these, these diets. So then the, uh, the eggs and bacon for breakfast isn't maybe the best way to go? Oof. I mean, we all kind of grew up with that. Um, at least I did um, as a kid in North Dakota. But it's a, it's a terrible mistake. Um, you're getting the animal fat and the cholesterol that fuels heart disease. You're getting carcinogens uh, in the, not, not just bacon, but all of the processed meat category, bacon, sausage, hot dogs, deli slices, ham. Um, those are clearly linked to colorectal cancer, also linked uh, strongly to breast cancer. You know, we should not be eating those things. And I know it's fashionable to take the kids out to, to Denny's for bacon and sausage. Um, that's really a bad thing to do for your children. Um, it puts them at risk and gives them the taste for things that are going to kill them in the long run. I, I'm always, when I'm doing these nutrition interviews, I'm always thinking of my parents and I'm, I'm, I often pick at them very lovingly during this because I want to help steer their diet and you, you can't really tell your parents what to do. You just can't. However, I was visiting my folks this past weekend and uh, mom was like, well, this is healthier. I'm having turkey bacon. Uh, still a processed meat. Um, it's it's still in the category that the, the World Health Organization considers these carcinogens in the same category as tobacco. Um, in, in other words, it's a strength of evidence. As sure as we are that tobacco causes cancer here, mm -hmm. that's as how sure we are that the processed meats cause cancer in your digestive tract. We are that sure. And turkey bacon is right there with the pork bacon. I'm sorry, mom. So let's go from there. Let's no, talk. No, no, no. Your, 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 your mom's lucky to have you looking out for her. <laughs> um, and she won't take you seriously because she remembers when, when she had to change your diaper. She can't take nutrition advice from somebody you knew as a toddler. But you are right. Um, vegetables and fruits and whole grains and beans are the healthy fuels for a healthy body. And the bacon, whether it's from a turkey or any other animal, um, is not healthy. And you want to get away from the meats and the dairy. It's fascinating. When she had me, I believe they gave her an injection to stop breast milk because they were considering it unhealthy at the time and instead made me a formula baby, as was all in vogue for nutrition back then. You're breaking my heart. You know, it's, it, it's true. Um, back, frankly, 
even to this day, for some people, it's considered unfashionable to breastfeed. Um, and sometimes, sometimes it's, well, for, for some women, it's uncomfortable, sometimes very uncomfortable if they haven't ever done it before and it's awkward. And, and uh, in, in a few cases, there are medical reasons why it can't happen. But I have to say, I think of breastfeeding as integral. It's an integral part of reproduction. It's, that is the, the food that the baby needs. And taking milk out of a cow is not a substitute for milk from mom. And if it comes out of a cow, you're getting cow proteins that the kid can react to badly. Type 1 diabetes is much more common in kids who are exposed early on to cow's milk proteins. We, however that tradition got started, it was really a mistake. So I was talking with my wife about this. She's pregnant. Uh, um, this is her second, second attempt. We miscarried this fall. We're back on the horse. Um, is dairy, because you did say cow, cow milk, and she's like, well, I, I try not to have cow milk. I did have a tiny bit of goat cheese this morning. Are all, is all dairy created equal? Yes. Sorry, what? Yes. Uh, people, push goat milk. people push goat milk because it's, it sounds more bucolic. We're going to the outside of town where there's a little goat dairy. Um, and, you know, they treat the goats really nicely. And um, uh, part, of this actually, part of the mystique of it is that goat milk is actually a little bit higher in saturated fat compared to cow's milk which means it's less healthy, but it has more of a buttery mouthfeel, so people liked it. Um, so no, no, it's not in any way healthier. And, and by the way, if you don't mind, I think it's useful for listeners to actually know where this comes from. Sure, the goats please. don't give milk. What happens is that the farmers impregnate them, um, and they do it with artificial insemination, typically. Um, it, well, at least that's true with cows, and in some cases they do it with goats, too. Um, and so the, the cows are not getting pregnant with roses and chocolates out in the field listening to Barry Manilow records. I mean, they're artificially inseminated. Um, and then when their offspring is born, the mother may have a tremendous bond with her, her baby, but that baby's going to be taken away. And if it's a male calf, he will be killed for veal. If it's female, she's going to be kept separated from her mother. Um, they will cry all night long. And if you live near a dairy, you will hear it. Um, because the farmer wants to sell the milk instead of giving the milk to the baby. And then, and this is true with goats, uh, too. They take away the kids, and they're going to kill them all if they're males, um, because they have no use for them. And the females are going to eventually take the place of their mothers. Uh, a, a cow in nature lives about 20 years. On, a cow on a dairy lives about four. At that point, they kill the mom because she's not producing as much milk as she used to, and they replace her with her daughter. Um, and she's now going to get artificially inseminated every year, and her offspring will be taken away. And when she's about four, her throat will be slit. The point I'm making is I'm a doctor, and I want people to think about the health issues. But for a lot of people, if they understand where these foods actually come from and what they're doing to animals or the environment, if it grosses them out just a little bit and makes them think, I don't want it for environmental reasons or humane reasons, well, your coronary arteries don't care why you do it. Um, so um, anyway, um, if, you, if, if, if you or your wife or anybody does go to one of these goat dairies, ask them, what do you do with the males? And check the honesty of their reply. Fascinating. I remember when I was racing bicycles in Wisconsin, and this is called Super Week, this bicycle race series, a long time ago, and everybody bid on having the, the racers over to their place overnight. And, and I, I think this one family on a farm, they, they, they bid a pizza or a couple pizzas for me and who knows what, so I would stay with them. It was kind, kind of prestigious. And I took off the next day and worked with them on a, on a dairy farm. And this was a traditional dairy farm. And so uh, Tessie the cow, which is interesting because now I have Tessie the Tesla. But Tessie the cow had this rectangular um, bar thing over her head. And she could only move about two feet forward or back. And that was her life. And she was attached to machinery. And I got to milk, milk the baby cow who then got hit by the farmer, which is a whole other story. I send you love. I know you didn't mean it. But, but it was a hard life to watch. It was really difficult to watch. I, yes, and, and let, let me be clear. You know, the people involved in animal agriculture are good people. Oh, they I, I think they're tremendous people. Yeah, um, you know, they're hardworking. They work very, very hard, um, and their life, frankly, is getting harder, not easier with the, the economic constraints that they're under. My dad grew up in that business. My grandfather was. My cousins are still. They raise cattle now. They're, they're good, decent people. However, time has moved on, 
and we have learned that the products they make cause heart disease, <laughs> they cause cancer, they cause obesity, they cause diabetes, and our ethics have moved on as well. And although I'm a doctor, I'm also a human being. And I think it's important for us to realize there are certain things that are just uncivilized. And I did plenty of them when I was a kid growing up in Fargo with my shotgun, waiting for the ducks and geese coming out of Canada. Um, and I drove cattle to slaughter personally. And at some point you realize this is just not the way to behave. And when you come to that ethical realization, then luckily your body gets the health benefit of getting rid of all the cholesterol and stuff too. I, I love it. I want to dive into some rules and easy ways to get started here. With that said, I was just traveling this past week, like I said, visited my folks. And I think I heard, I don't even know where in the grapevine, that in Wyoming or Wyoming airports, they were, they were uh, banning the t-shirts now that were in the Wyoming airport gift shops that, that had to do with cow tipping. And, and cow tipping is now finally out. <laughs> Well, um, fair enough. All right. What are the two rules that we want to follow if we're going to more of a plant-based? And I say plant-based for a reason, because I'm not going to be militant about it. And I want people to do it as, as best they can, because I think being more inclusive makes it easier. But what are the two rules that people want to follow? Well, um, I, I guess there are a few things. Um, I encourage people to avoid all animal products, mm -hmm. and I do want them to take a, a vitamin B12 supplement. And let me, let me tell you why this is. Um, uh, you're going to get plenty of protein on a plant-based diet, and maybe we can talk about that if you need to, but, but they're, they're, the protein is really not an issue. It's, it's, it's a thing people worry about. Well, but, go there, because that's mom's number one question. Where are you going to get the protein? Number two would be, because she's been indoctrinated in the marketing, where are you going to get the quality protein? <laughs> Okay. All right. Should we talk about that? Um, yeah. So rule number one is is plant based, but but we got to go into the protein since you brought it up. All right. Um, the old the, the 1950s idea was here's my plate. The meat has the protein, mm -hmm. the vegetable has the vitamins, mm -hmm. and the starch has the calories or something like that. Um, and so the idea is if the pro if the meat isn't there, there's no protein left. Well, what if you took that broccoli that was there? And what if that's actually all you ate? Um, does it have protein? The government says that a woman should have about 46 grams of protein a day. Um, a man, maybe 56. And it varies a little bit depending on how big you are and how active, but th those are pretty good rules. 46 for women, 56 for men. If I ate my normal portion size, same number of calories, but all I ate for a day was broccoli. Not that you'd ever do this, but just for argument's sake. Green out of your if ears. You did, if you did that, you would get 146 grams of pure protein. In other words, about 100 more than you actually need. And if you think about it, bulls eat green vegetables. They're eating grass all day long. They have massive uh, musculature. Same for cows, same for elephants and giraffes. So plants have a lot of protein. Let's say you did it uh, with lentils, just lentils. If, if all you did on a day was ate your normal portions, but it was, everything was a lentil, you'd get 157 grams of pure protein. Now, the truth is you have some broccoli and some lentils and some carrots and different things. But if you add up the protein in any normal, varied plant-based diet, vegan diet, protein is not an issue. Very, very good. And of course, I've got to say, and what about if you're pregnant? And if you're pregnant, well, you are eating for two. One of you is very, very small. Um, <laughs> And so that slight addition of food that, that you're going to naturally be eating will give more than enough protein for you and for your baby. And the last thing that you want to do yes. is to have animal products that are harmful to your baby. So you want to be eating healthy things, the fruits and the vegetables and the grains and the beans. And the women who go into pregnancy on completely plant-based diets do the best. Um, there's not, hasn't been a lot of research on IQ and kids raised to vegetarian and vegan mothers. Um, but what we have shows quite a substantial benefit. So in, in any case, we know there's no harm. And it looks like these kids who are raised on vegan diets, I mean, they just do great. Um, I, I really think that's the standard for the future. And, and by the way, the rules for kids are the same. Uh, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans. Those are the four food groups. Vegan. And they need B12 too. So and that's rule want, number two. So dive in, B12. Um, B12 is a funny thing because it's not made by animals and it's not made by plants, but vitamin B12 is something you need for healthy nerves and you need it for healthy blood cells. And so uh, it's made by bacteria 
And some people will say, well, prior to the advent of modern hygiene, the bacteria in the soil or on our fingers or in our mouths would give us the 2.4 micrograms of B12 that we need. Whether that hygiene theory is really true or not, I don't know. Meat eaters will get some B12 typically because in a cow's intestinal tract, there are bacteria uh, that make B12, and some of it gets in the meat, some gets in the dairy. But a lot of people don't absorb that because it's, or they don't absorb it well, because it's tightly adhered to the protein. So where people run into trouble is they might be a meat eater, but they're not making enough stomach acid, or they're on metformin for diabetes, or they're taking massive blocker, and they end up in the hematology suite. Um, so I encourage everybody to take a B12 supplement. And if you're a vegan, it's, it's in my view, really essential. Um, but it's easy because it's in every multiple vitamin that you ever took, whether it's a one a day type or a Flintstones, or you, they all have B12. Um, and you can just go to the drugstore or the health food store and pick up B12. Take the smallest one that they sell, take it every day. And, and doesn't matter the source of the B12 or does it? Um, they're all plant derived. Um, so no, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Fantastic. Okay, so let's go from there. We want to get started with when, this. When I say plant derived, what I, what I mean is they're, they're, they're microbially derived. They're, they're, not, they're, they're not animal. They're not animal sourced. So actually, on that note, you want to go to algae for a second? Okay. So because a lot of us are told we need to be getting um, our oils from the sea, and if we don't want to go with a fish-based oil, then we're told to go to algae or to, or actually not to go to algae, to go to the the little shrimp-like critters, which are getting oh, soaked, or krill. stripped out of the oil. krill oil. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, y y there are two essential oils that you do, do need. One is called ALA or al yeah. alpha linolenic. This will not be on the test. Alpha linolenic acid or and linoleic acid, and they are in plants. But some people will say, "Well, I'm impatient. Um, I want to have DHA as my oil." Yeah. And what they're thinking of is is um, DHA is the fat that gets into the brain. It's you take the essential oil and your body lengthens it and makes DHA. Um, if you have fish, um, it's mostly not a essential fat, but there is some DHA in fish, um, and some of that can be useful. Um, but um, you can get algal-sourced DHA, too. So if you were going to the store and you get the fish oil, or, or go online, and you look up DHA, they got it from fish, and they got it from algae. And you, I would encourage you to get the one. It's called vegan DHA. It's the same stuff. It just doesn't make your breath smell. Um, and it's perfectly fine. There's no mercury in it. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying people need to supplement DHA. Um, the studies on heart benefit have really kind of crashed and burned. Um, and I'm talking about for fish oil, it just isn't showing much benefit. Um, but, but there's the, the one thing where we're still unsure is whether it might reduce the risk of Alzheimer's. And here, I don't know. Um, when a lot of people are tested and, and you can get tested, you can get a DHA test kit. They'll send it to your house. They do a finger stick and you send in a drop of blood and they'll tell you your DHA blood level. And if you're low, um, you go online and you put vegan DHA in and you order it and you take it and you test again. Um, and some people use fish oil and some people use the vegan one, but I would always choose the, the vegan sources. They're cleaner and have no ethical issues. Very cool. So let's say we're getting started into uh, more of a plant-based diet. How and where do we start? Because this is where I see when people switch diets, if you don't have a plan in advance, you typically crash and burn and implode because at first you're going on willpower and then you run out of options and things blow up. Yes. Um, th there is a way that we do this. Um, we started it with our research studies. We've had more than a thousand people go through our various research studies and they're all nervous and, you know, like, gee, and I want to get over my diabetes or I want to lose weight. I want to get my cholesterol down, whatever the point of that study is. But how do I do a vegan diet? We break it into two steps. Step one is you take seven days. Mm -hmm. And during these seven days, you don't take anything out of your diet. You don't go vegan yet. For, the, for these seven days, what you do is you explore your options. So I take a piece of paper, and it's got four categories, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack. And I ask the individual, and you can do this yourself, you know, if you're thinking, I want to go vegan. For seven days, take your paper and write in the vegan possibilities you'd like to try. So, gee, every day I have cornflakes with milk. The vegan version would be cornflakes with almond milk or soy milk or rice milk or hemp milk. I never tasted any of those. 
fine, you got seven days, go to the store and try one or two or three or whatever. And I decide the almond milk with that's vanilla flavored is the one I like. Write it down. Um, and then off to lunch. Every day I go over to the submarine sandwich place. I have a meat, meat sandwich and I guess I'll have to make me the veggie one with the, the lettuce and tomatoes and whatever. So you write that down or I go to the taco place. Now I'll have the bean burrito, which I never had before. So you just write these things down. Um, and then after seven days, you found lots of vegan things you like for breakfast and lunch and dinner. Step two is you take three weeks and now eat the foods that you picked out in the first first phase and make it all vegan all the time. No animal products. But that's easy because it's only three weeks and you already know what you like because you've tested it all. And at the end of that time, you're going to have lost weight and felt if you have weight to lose, you're going to feel healthier, you're going to feel better. But also you'll discover your tastes are drifting and you start to like these foods and you're kind of forgetting the foods that got you into trouble. So the physical changes and the taste changes make the next week seem really easy. And so people then, they just get excited and they want to continue. So that's what we do. We break it into two steps. I've never seen anyone unable to do it. Excellent. Excellent. So what would you say are a few quick substitutes for replacing meat? Um, some of them are li literal substitutes. So if you have sausage for breakfast, the store has veggie sausage. Um, if you have a burger for lunch, they've got the veggie burger. Um, and you can go to the store and get frozen little cut up meat like things that work in stir fries and so forth. They, they might be made of uh, wheat gluten or might be made of soy or, or something else. Um, then there are also things that are just sort of not literal. It's not exactly meat, but um, you go to a, an Italian restaurant and they'll bring your angel hair pasta with either the meat sauce mm -hmm. or the arrabbiata sauce, which has chunky vegetables and it just doesn't have meat in it. Or you go to the Chinese restaurant and they have the rice and the vegetables and the tofu. And it's not exactly a meat substitute, but it's delicious food that has been refined over thousands of years of culinary effort. Uh, or you go to the sushi bar and instead of the fish sushi, they give you the cucumber sushi or the asparagus sushi or whatever it might be. Um, so there's lots of things to replace these things. It's just really a question of testing and trying. And, and what almost always happens is people discover that instead of seeming restrictive, it seems liberating. You discover there are so many wonderful things to eat. Well, we're, we've, we've been down this road almost our whole lifetime, both my, myself and my wife, and, and we still go into the grocery store and we try to eat all the colors of the rainbow and are continuously finding new veggies that we have mm -hmm. to ask, what do you do with this thing? It looks, it looks like an right. alien creature, what in the world? But we're continuously discovering new vegetables and, and we're convinced that every single thing, every single thing that you eat, particularly plant-based fruit, veggies, has its own phytonutrients. It has its own makeup to it. It has something special to offer. And so trying all of these different things is only going to make us healthier. That is so true. And you know, when I was a kid, it was roast beef, baked potatoes, and corn. That, that was what we ate, except for special occasions when it was roast beef, baked potatoes, and peas. You know, that was about it. And, you know, I never had a papaya as a child in Fargo, North Dakota. I never tasted a mango. You know, a strawberry was about as adventurous as you ever got. Um, and to be able to, to branch out and try, not just different foods, but different, whole different cuisines. Um, here, I live in Washington, D.C. now, but all over the place, you can have Italian and Mexican and Chinese and Sichuan and Hunan and Thai and Vietnamese and, and these, all of these traditions, particularly those that are countries we think of as being economically kind of poor, they figured out ways of making wonderful meals with simple plant-based foods. Um, so you can explore these things and really, really enjoy them. And if you told me, no, you can't have any of that, you got to go back to roast beef, baked potatoes, and corn, I'd say, wait a minute, don't take away my vegan diet. It's not just healthier, but it's so much better. So at least let me get to the GMO corn and get to some sweet potatoes instead of the white potatoes. <laughs> Tell, talk to me about about uh, going plant based and losing weight. What do I want to be aware of and why? Uh, when when people get away from animal products, um, everything you're going to eat is from a plant, and plants have fiber, and fiber fills you up, and it doesn't have any calories effectively. And so, when you go to a plant based diet, you're going to lose weight really easily. Now, if you get stuck, um, the reason is usually that you were letting oily foods come in and substitute because oil 
has plant oils are healthier than animal fat, but the calorie content is just as high. So you want to keep the oils low too. So weight loss, two rules, avoid the animal products, keep oils really low. You do that, you're going to lose weight. How about improving, improving blood pressure? Um, I would do the same thing uh, because weight loss will also help with, with blood pressure, but it does one thing in addition. It, it improves your blood viscosity. Um, we were talking about that earlier with related, related to athletic performance, but if your blood is less viscous, less thick, it takes less effort for your heart to push it through the blood vessels, and so your blood pressure comes down. The other thing, uh, sodium, salt, will raise your blood pressure. Uh, you wanna keep salt low, and, and this is another good reason to avoid cheese if you needed another reason. It's high in the bad fat that makes your blood viscosity go through the roof, and it's super high. There, there's more there's more sodium in cheese than there is in potato chips, ounce per ounce. So it's super high in sodium. Uh, but the other thing is when you go toward vegetables, instead, they're high in potassium as a blood pressure-lowering mineral. Very cool. I'm going back to my wife, and then, then we're going to tackle some other things. She's, you know, queasy, first trimester, and exhausted. Are there certain foods that she can eat that will help give her more energy through the day? Um, well, not to get too personal, but is she doing a completely plant-based diet now? She is, uh, I'd say, 90, 90 some odd, 95, 99. Um, if she's not feeling well, she might do some whole foods chicken noodle soup. That's happened a couple times, and she does like a tiny bit of cheese. Okay. Um, the, the reason that I ask, and I think this is a little bit of a frontier, but there has been some interesting speculation as to why do women during pregnancy get nauseated um, sometimes. And this is, it's only a theory, but it's an interesting theory. The theory is this, you've got a baby developing inside you. The baby is half your genes and half your husband's genes or partner's genes, whatever the case may be. So in other words, that baby is half foreign, if, if you could think of it that way. So the body disables the immune system a little bit so that you're not rejecting your baby. What that means is that mom is now has less immune defenses and she's likely to get sick. And so what are the things that are gonna bring bacteria into her life more than anything else? Meats. And what do women get annoyed with uh, when they're pregnant? They, they get disgusted by a lot of food. Their, their, their senses go way up for certain foods they do not want and meat is at the top of the list. But dairy can be on that list too. Um, when women get morning sickness, um, very often it relates to the consumption of animal products. So if a woman has morning sickness, I encourage them to go 100% plant-based, also keep the oils low and see if those, if those things don't improve. Um, I don't know that that's a solution for everybody. And it sounds like your wife is doing a million times better than most other women, but it's worth a shot. Thank you. So going on the other end of the uh, female spectrum, what can you tell us about uh, women pre-menopause or during menopause? Yeah. Um, Many women going through menopause, not all. So, um, some women sail right through menopause without a, well, missing a beat. Uh, some women do have hot flashes, and for some, they persist and can be really troubling. Um, when we look across cultures, it appears that menopausal symptoms were quite rare in Japan prior to westernization. Um, in other words, women ate pretty much a uh, um, a rice-based diet with ve mostly vegetables, no dairy, really, uh, to speak of, and virtually no meat, except once in a while used as sort of a flavoring for the noodles or the, or the rice or whatever. Um, and once the diet started westernizing and meat and dairy came in, we started to see a lot more menopausal symptoms. So what we think is happening is that when, a woman, when women are on plant-based diets, their estrogen, female sex hormone levels, are lower. They are adapted to those lower levels. And then when menopause arrives, the shift to an even lower menopause uh, estrogen level is not as dramatic, mm -hmm. and they tend to not really have the symptoms. In America, in westernized countries, because of the diet, women have higher estrogen levels, and menopause goes way down, and you've effectively got estrogen withdrawal, if you want to put it that way. This is still a theory, um, but it's good to put to use. For some women, they do get benefit from soy, yeah. uh, the addition of tofu and soy milk. For other women, it doesn't really seem to make much difference. If we roll the clock ben that back, then got to ask, what about cramps? Oh, my goodness sakes. Um, I was sitting at this very desk, 
30 years ago, I guess now. Um, and a woman called me up, had terrible cramps. And I started thinking about what cramps, meant, uh, what they are. It's the lining of the uterus expands every month in response to estrogen. Um, and at the end of the month, the body realizing we're not pregnant, it sheds that lining in menstrual flow. And when it sheds that lining, that lining called the endometrium, it releases prostaglandins that cause cramps. So anyway, she, she called me on the phone and was telling me about her symptoms. I started thinking, well, what can we do to basically change the hormone balance so that we don't have this big flood of estrogens every month that's causing that over thickening of the endometrium and causing all these prostaglandins? So I said, avoid all the animal products, no dairy, and also keep oils really low. And it effectively cured her cramps. So that was one case. So we did a research study with lots of women and found that for many it works. So if a woman has cramps, don't take this on faith. Just try it for the next cycle, the next full month, mm -hmm. uh, one period to the next. No animal products at all. Keep vegetable oils, all oils, really low. Don't eat a lot of fried stuff. And eat fruits and grains and, whole, and, and beans and whole grains. Take your vitamin B12 um, and see if your cramps don't disappear or are greatly contained the next month. Beautiful. Thank you. Real. Tell us real briefly about cancer and uh, animals. Well, first of all, um, we've been talking about hormones. And for hormone-related cancers, such as breast cancer or for men, prostate cancer, same thing. You want to avoid dairy. You want to avoid uh, meat products. But also um, the digestive-type cancers, like colorectal cancer, those are related to meats. For, uh, the worst of the lot are bacon, sausage, ham, um, the deli slices, uh, the, the, this category we call processed meats. But, but other meats can contribute to it as well. And if people are avoiding meat and having high fiber plant-based diets, their risk of these kinds of cancers is greatly diminished. So thank you so much. I've got, to, uh, if I look at my dad, he's a skinny guy with a big Santa belly which I can't help but think is total and complete inflammation. It's not so much fat. It's hard as a rock. What can you tell me about the inflato belly? Well, it, um, I, I think there are two things. Part of it is the development of fat, um, prob probably. Um, the other part of it is that, the, 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 I mean, there, there's many different things to say, but let me just throw out a couple. Um, your digestive tract is an interesting thing. Um, not yours, everybody's. Um, if, if a person sends fatty food down the digestive tract, mm -hmm. and I'm talking about meat, cheese, but also fried foods, um, the digestive tract suddenly gets um, very unselective about what things it's going to let through into the bloodstream. You know, your digestive tract has a hard job to do. It's the things you eat. It doesn't want to let just everything through into your bloodstream. You get poisoned. Mm -hmm. So it's very selective. But when you throw a whole bunch of grease through, it's, it causes the digestive tract to, to lose that selectivity and stuff slips through. One of the things that slips through is what are called endotoxins that are produced by the bacteria, the normal bacteria in your digestive tract. They make what are called endotoxins. And if you're on a high fat diet, like let's say today, you greatly increase the fat content of your diet. Within five days, your digestive tract will start letting those endotoxins through into your bloodstream. And they are toxins. Um, they will interfere with cellular metabolism. They are inflammatory. When I say inflammatory, um, inflammation is your body's response to a bee sting, for example. Um, various cellular um, products will cause uh, in local inflammation in that area, causing swelling, causing antibodies to come in. And that can happen through the whole body and cause all kinds of issues. Um, it causes your metabolism to get goofed up. Um, your, your, your ability to burn calories is impaired. And so weight gain can be one of the results of it. So thank you so much. And, and from there, tell us really, really briefly about protecting your brain. Wow. I'll tell you, it was 1993 that I think the page turned. That was when the Chicago Health and Aging Projects started. And they started tracking the foods that seemed to be linked to Alzheimer's disease. And they found that people in, this was done in Chicago, a very large sample group, those people who ate the most saturated fat had the most Alzheimer's. Saturated fat is the fat in dairy, especially cheese. Uh, also in meat, meat's the second biggest source. And the converse was 
that people who just didn't eat cheese and meat or ate very little had dramatically lower risk of Alzheimer's. And then it also seemed to be true with trans fats. Those are the, the vegetable oils that are hardened to simulate animal fat. Uh, that was, those, those, those were driving Alzheimer's too. And people who ate uh, little bits of nuts or seeds that had vitamin E, natural vitamin E, not, not a pill, but in foods, they were protected. Uh, people who exercise a lot in other studies appear to be protected a bit. So that's just the beginning. But um, it looks like foods can protect us against Alzheimer's disease to us. Uh, awesome. To great how about inflammation and pain, like our joints? <sighs> yeah. Um, we are actually just now doing a research study on, on rheumatoid arthritis. Um, oh, but, we're, but we're also seeing some benefits with osteoarthritis. Bottom line, uh, rheumatoid arthritis is another one of these autoimmune conditions where you look at the lining of the joint. It's inflamed. Something is attacking it. Um, the, the inciting factor can often be a food. Dairy is probably the most common, not the only one. Thank you so much. Where can people go to find out more and to find your fantastic book? Oh, well, thank you. Um, the Vegan Starter Kit is, I, I wrote this to be something you can read it in 45 minutes mm -hmm. and feel confident that you know how to begin. And I've written a bazillion other books um, that are, each one is as big enough to probably and a door, and you'll you'll see them on Amazon and other places. But uh, you're, if you have a bookstore in your neighborhood, they probably appreciate your business too. And my my real hope with the Vegan Starter Kit is that people will get two copies because there's somebody that they know who's in a little bit of trouble, and they can help them by allowing them to explore uh, vegan foods. and And I kind of gave it, I, I kind of wrote it as something for people to give to someone who needs a little help. Beautiful, beautiful. And what's the URL? Uh, PCRM. Dot org. That stands for Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, pcrm.org. Fantastic. And if you didn't catch pcrm.org, come on over to inspirenationshow.com. We'll get you over to pcrm.org so you can get those two copies of the book or more as well. I've got to ask my wife, the producer, she wouldn't let me get off the hook without asking this question. I'm going to ask advice for parents to help their kids, but let's talk about parents helping their kids if the kids weren't raised initially on a plant-based diet. Well, you know, the science marches along. So you've, you're, you've, you've already got your kids and then suddenly you realize, oh, oh wow, I, I should do something else. Um, when I was a kid in the 50s and 60s, uh, my mother realized she was feeding us whole milk. She not, knew, wanted to move to skim. Now, she would have done better to move to almond milk or soy milk, but that was her thing. Here's what she didn't do, and, and I, I credit her for this. Yeah. She didn't say, kids, do you want to eat healthier? You choose. She, what she said is, I'm not buying that whole milk anymore, and you're not going to drink it. We're, we are going to be healthy as a family. That's it. And you know what? I think that's really important. Some, there's a time when parents have to be parents, and, they, and they, you're not going to smoke in this house, you know, and, and, and that's the way my mother was. Uh, of course, when kids are 18 or 19 or 20, they'll do whatever they want to. But when they're four and five and six, that's the time to really make a diet change. So if the parents listening to this think, gee, a plant-based diet would be good for me, it's also good for you, uh, if, for your kids. And it's good to say, all right, kids, let's do this together. And everybody does it. Everybody gets into agreement and they think of all the reasons why. And if you want, you can watch films like What the Health. Um, or forks over knives together. Everybody gets all pumped up. And you give kids um, jobs. Like, you know, the, the kid who's four years old could tear up the lettuce for the salad and get people involved in it and make sure everybody knows why we're doing this um, and help them sort out social situations. Like you're at a birthday and the kids are eating hot dogs. Um, and kids who are raised that way get a wonderful, wonderful advantage that other kids can just envy. Excellent. Thank you so much, Neil. Any last words of wisdom you want to share with people today? Um, I would just encourage people to give it a try. Don't give up your skepticism. Um, there's all kinds of diets out there. And if you're thinking, I'm not sure if this is for me, give it a shot. Take a week, just try out vegan foods, then take three weeks where it's all vegan all the time and see if you don't like it. And if, if you find it life-changing, spread the word, let other people know. Thank you so much, Neil. I want to give you a big hug. You're a really, really good guy. <laughs> thank you oh, so thank much. thank you. Very kind of you. Thank you so much for spreading the word. Uh, you're most welcome. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get the vegan starter kit, and begin eating more plant-based today and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you so, so much, Neil. All right. Thanks for including me. I really appreciate it. Good luck to your wife. Thank you. Bye.
Um, she's lucky to have you, but you're even luckier to have her. You are not kidding. <laughs> I was nowhere without her. All right. Very good. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>